Hello everybody and welcome to another interview in my Successful Entrepreneurs Stories Interviews. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to my friend, the very immodest Steve Pollard. He's a serial entrepreneur and he is a self-proclaimed business guru and sales and marketing genius which is why I call him my immodest friend. And you can uh, see his profile on LinkedIn, and he considers himself to be immodest too. And, and Steve has a long history in entrepreneurship and is going to share uh, some of those stories, uh, and the, the good, the bad, and, and the plain hard stories with us today. So Steve, welcome. It's uh, very, very great to have you uh, talking to me today. Thank you, Adele. It's great, great to be part of this uh, podcast. Thank you. So, Steve, would you please tell our listeners how you came to be an entrepreneur? Uh, you know, maybe your early career path, the successes, failures, and, and some of the experiences you've had uh, in, in your career to date. Okay. Uh, I feel almost everything that I've done to date has all impacted on everything that I do now. Um, my first, one of my first jobs as a youth training scheme at the time, leaving school, I was uh, a software programmer for very early uh, programming codes, so I learned a lot about computers right at the start before there was no chance everyone had a computer on their desktop at home, never mind at work. Um, and then I moved to London because jobs were thin on the ground in Scotland at the time, and I ended up working in sales and marketing for a kitchen company and doing telemarketing for British Telecom at night and I was one of the first people who would ever have phoned any UK households to sell them anything in the UK whereas you're now getting phone calls from overseas for all sorts of things and we hate this it was, and everybody hates it because yes. it's done very badly yes. um, but I was one of the first people it was a, a new thing that came to the UK from America it had never really been done before and obviously British Telecom is one of the big telecoms picked it up they had a large call centre in London, and we were selling everything, timeshare, um, subscriptions to magazines, you name it, we sold it. And that, everything I've done since then has been around computers and telephone selling. You know, I, I built my businesses around making appointments by phone for then face-to-face -face appointments, and ultimately now doing all my business by phone and internet and using technology, computers to aid sales and marketing strategies to business. So in your career, you also established a business called MoneyQuest, which for our listeners, uh, that was a mortgage broking business. And yes. the mortgage market in the UK, and I know this from experience as, as a big property investor, is incredibly competitive. Yes. So, And you, were, you, you had that business for 10 years, if I recall correctly? We, we actually set it up, we, we, we had the business for 20 oh, years. Oh, 20, overall. you're right. Yeah, Sorry, um, 20. Yes. And again, we set that up, um, myself, my brother, uh, myself at first, and then my brother uh, joined me, and my primary three school buddy joined me as well. So we'd known each other for years, and it was a hard slog. Basically, we created appointments in the council house market to help people with right to buy. Um, and these people were wanting to get a discount and get mortgages for their house. They'd rented for years, didn't understand finance. To them, it was a noose round their neck. Mm. And we spent the time with them showing the comparison of the ongoing rent and increases versus getting a mortgage and maybe getting a new kitchen and bathroom for your house and being able to pass something on to your family. So loads of people took up that opportunity and these houses have passed down the generations and helped with the next round of house purchases in the UK. So um, that was how we got started. And again, the business was about, at that time, um, council house purchase. We then moved into working much more closely with the builders, you know, the large builders at the time, Wimpy, um, all the main players, the main, main developers. And they would have people come on to their um, developments who would be talk to the salespeople, they'd be interested in the house, they would recommend money quest, we would go out and see them about the mortgage options and help them sell houses and help these people get the mortgages. We were in Yellow Pages in the UK, we were in every single Yellow Pages in the UK before the internet came along mm. and I'd been reading for years about this you know, information superhighway as it was being 
badged at the time and as a computer geek or an early computer geek before before it really got geeky um, I was interested that you know the information super highly it sounded really intriguing and I wanted to know more so we were one of the first companies to set up a website it didn't really do anything and to be honest no website did anything then you couldn't do online banking you you know, you could hardly do anything with a website. It was just an online brochure. Mm -hmm. um, they looked ugly. They were basic. They had no functionality. But I knew there was something in it. And we slowly learned how to get the website to generate leads. And we found that the leads we got from the internet were of a higher value to us from a commission point of view than our Yellow Pages leads. And they were easier to close. So we slowly wound down our Yellow Pages and we built up the marketing Google appeared on the scene. I mean, even Google wasn't there at first. Um, so you didn't have all the options that you had, pay-per-click advertising. This was all new. We got in early, learned all about it, and eventually we were generating 4,000 leads a month directly from the internet for mortgage and insurance business. Wow. And you grow your, grew your business pretty substantially, didn't you? How many staff did you have in the end? We ended up with 170 full-time employed staff, all suited and booted in one of the most expensive call centres in Glasgow. So one of the sort of parts of this brief you said to me about mistakes, and I think um, I think now uh, you can become a very light-touch business uh, who looks and feels the part working from home or smaller premises. You don't need to spend fortunes on premises or employed staff because a lot of it, don't, don't get me wrong, some people, some businesses need that, but you can be clever about it now and you can provide a, a, a real um, joined up business, you know, large business feeling and presence, you know, you can present yourself very well, mm. but you could have big chunks of your operation outsourced, um, you know, freelancers, you know, not full time employed and that's what I've got now in my new business. Um, a massive overhead you would have had in, in running that. Absolutely massive, but I don't think there was ever an easy month, you know, with the, you know, looking back, um, <laughs> that's why I've got a, a full full head of grey hair and I'm only 25 years old. No, I'm, I'm 48 years old, so, um, yeah, no, I'll turn you grey overnight, that stuff, if you don't get it right. I mean, the, the, the wind just had to blow ever so slightly and we were in a panic about where the 350 grand a month wage bill was going to get paid and you know cash flow you you, you know you there's just ways to do things better now you know you don't you don't need to tie yourself up a notch you don't need to put yourself or grow in the wrong direction that's a mistake you've got to plan out your businesses a bit better so you don't hit these problems and my business now is about taking all the things I learned and all the money that I burned and all the money that I made money on and profit profit all the exercises I profited on and taking these big business techniques and tools and strategies and applying them to small, medium and large businesses who don't need to learn the hard way, you know, yes. they don't need to go through the pain barriers or the costs that I went through. They so can did, hit the ground running from the start. I agree. I'll come on to your new business that we will come okay. in a moment. But just um, going back to MoneyQuest, the mortgage business, as I said, it was incredibly competitive. So what stood you apart from other players um, in the market? Was it simply nailing the, the Google AdWords and before that the um, the yellow pages or did you have some other USB fees, if you like? I suppose the delivery of the service itself was key because we eventually moved from a make the appointment by phone for a face-to-face -face appointment to do everything by phone yep. um, and eventually we moved into the English market which is one of the biggest steps and I remember at first we were Scottish, we were a Scottish company based in Scotland, all speaking Scottish and sounding Scottish and I said to my guys one day, right, we're going to do business all across the UK and we're going to start you know, opening Yellow Pages in Leicester and Liverpool and all these places and for the first few weeks they didn't sell anything. There was a mental barrier and I had to go back on the phones myself and make the first sale in England to a nice woman who was very easy to deal with and she bought and I sent her the paperwork in the post and she sent it back all signed and filled in and that was her first mortgage and then after that, you know, very quickly we were up to 700 mortgages a month in England. Wow. Mm, brilliant. 
Um, strong financial management and systems and processes must have been key in your mortgage quest business, am I right? They should have been key. Um, and the, it's easier to make those things key now. Um, I, again, we had departments. I had a you know, financial guy and his assistant and all the rest of it. You can outsource a lot of that kind of stuff now. And mm. you get products like Zero and great accounting products to, to run businesses and report on businesses and work out what's working and what's not and where to put your money. So totally agree with the statement that strong financial management and systems and processes are key. Um, did I apply them as well to MoneyQuest and, and the way I applied them, did it cost me more than it could have or should have? Yes, but that was kind of the way everybody did it then. But now I wouldn't do it again that, that way. There's better ways to, to deliver financial management to a business. Well, I guess given how strong your sales and marketing skills are, often sales and marketing people don't like the numbers. They don't like the discipline of most, most financials and, and systems. Yeah, most don't. I like number crunching, I like numbers, I like reports, um, and I'm good at it, but paperwork and accounts and tax and VAT and all that kind of stuff, and wage bills and page earn, you know, that's kind of an accounting for the business's performance to the tax plan, that's kind of somebody else's job, but there's loads of people out there who can do that. But yes, I agree, most salespeople, if any businessman out there thinks he can be the accounting department, the manager, the the chief cook and bottle washer, and, and uh, you know the marketing guy and the admin guy and the the dog's body in his business. Then he's absolutely kidding himself on. Um, it's too hard, and that's where a lot of businesses fall over. They think they need another member of staff to perform a task, and they can't. Have, they don't have enough tasks in that area. Say marketing for talking sake. Mm. They think they need a marketing, they know they need marketing, so the business owner does it. Yeah. He's probably the worst marketer in the world. Oh, indeed. He's going to create flyers that look terrible. He's going to write letters that are dramatically incorrect and don't work. He's going to build a website for himself that looks horrible and, if anything, sets the company back mm -hmm. because he thinks he, the alternative is to get a web designer or, or bring a graphic designer in. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you can hire small bits of these people now. So everything, all, all parts of the business process are now easier for businesses uh, to uh, tap into if they know what they're doing. Yeah, I agree. So um, unlike many mortgage company owners, um, you actually managed to sell your business during the uh, global financial crisis. Yes. Was that luck, good management, negotiation, or did you have, was that part of your exit strategy, part of your original vision to, to be able to sell? Well, what we ended up selling for, um, and I, I look in the view of you mirror at this often, um, was probably 50 times less than what we'd, a number would put, put out there to the market at, at one point of what we expected, and it was three times less than a a deal that we had on the table about five years previous to selling. So we always expected more. We expected the good times to last. Like everybody, I think the credit crunch really shook things up for people and made them realise that you can hit recession, stroke, depression pretty fast and and it's pretty hard. Um, and even in the best of businesses, you know, there was 300-year-old banks, Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland, about to go bust in Scotland. Mm. If a 300-year-old bank is going to go bust, a 20-year-old mortgage company that's got very tight margins has got no chance of survival um, with 170 staff, etc. Mm. Um, and saying that we could have survived, you know, we could just have said, you know, cut it down to the top 30 guys, but it's getting out of these big leases that you're in and all the rest of it, yeah. and it's very hard to do. So we should have seen it coming sooner, but... We negotiated a deal that got me out personally. I went to Australia, I had time to kill and, you know, money in the bank. Not as much as it should have been, but I'll get that back next time around. <laughs> That's what I keep doing. And it's all about learning. You you have taken those lessons. Absolutely. Very and now valuable. you've set up Business Uplift. Tell mm -hmm. us more about that business and, and how you've used your previous experiences to create a different business model that will be very successful and, and is being very successful already. Well, when I sold MoneyQuest, I uh, spent a couple of years in Australia. I've got a young son there, so 
for the past 15 years I've been kind of half Australia, half Scotland. Um, and it surprised me how long it took me to realise what I wanted to do next. I kind of thought I'd think of something really fast and it didn't come as fast as I thought. And then I was playing about looking for domain names, which is a kind of hobby of mine sometimes. And I was thinking, you know, I've, I'm good at advising business. I've been through a lot, spent a lot of money, I've made a lot of money. I, I understand what works on the internet, what doesn't. I understand sales and marketing strategies, business processes. And I thought of the idea of a business consultancy that offered those services to small, medium and large businesses rather than them try and do it themselves and try and cater for as many services as they need mm. with one point of contact that's low cost, I, I kind of mentally you know, badge myself as the, the, the Ryanair of business improvement services, you know, you'll get to where you want to but you won't pay a fortune to get there mm-hmm. um, and that's that's how we run the business, I don't charge fortunes, I, I'm trying to stack them high, sell them cheap but if I get the systems in place then people can, you know, business owners can come to me for website advice, website designs, online marketing, promotional material, videos for the business, recruitment assistance for, for new staff, help managing the business, you know, um, check and balance, you know, all, all of the things that they need, graphic design, social media marketing, all these things that the business owner's badly trying to do himself just now and taking his eye off the ball, mm. he can outsource it for a fraction of the cost if he needs four or five hours of work a week on those areas, that's all he ends up paying for, and it feels like his own marketing department. It's very light touch, it's very low cost, and it's very flexible. Mm, it's fascinating. So how's, how's it going? What, what's your vision for a start? The vision is, again, to build up for some reason, because I had 170 staff before, it's like losing 170 kids, so I kind of want them back. So I want to build up to 150 freelancers around the world who are trained to follow my procedures, process, project management um, structure, if you like, and then find the business owners who need the services and feed that army of professional providers and everybody wins. You know, the providers get regular work, but they're not on my books. You know, I don't pay them if I get, if I give them 20 hours of work one week, they get paid for 20 hours. If it's 30, the next great. But if I give them nothing next week, I don't have to pay them. Whereas in the employed position, you've got to pay them no matter what. Yeah. Um, so it's, a, it's more flexible from my point of view. Um, I become an important source of business to these people at 20 plus hours a week, mm. even at 10 hours plus a week. Yeah. And it's just a case I need, I need good web designers, good copywriters, good graphic designers, good um, sales and marketing people, good telemarketers. And I can put a label over all these people, make them work a certain way, be accountable, um, deliver consistency across the board, deliver what I say they're going to deliver for a fair price for the customer, and then these customers can tap into that. And as I said, there's there's no end to the amount of businesses who need that service, and I just haven't really pushed the button on expanding it massively yet because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And I want to make sure the foundations are right across the board that we're as efficient as we can be building a website, creating a flyer, doing a corporate video, all of those things. Because mm. if I can be efficient, I can keep my prices low and then I offer it out en masse to the market. Well, you can scale it, you'll be able to scale it very quickly if you get if you get the fundamentals right. You get the Absolutely. Of the well, it's very scalable because the people are out there, you know, the... I'm saying I want 150 freelancers. There's probably five million good guys out there who would fit the bill. Mm-hmm. You know, I just need 150. That 150 could change. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be a hardcore of 150, but there, there could be some in, some out. Every so often, as they some go back to full-time employment. You know, it, it's maybe my 20 hours isn't enough for them, and they, they can't get the rest for talking sake. So they go back to full-time employment because they need that. So there's reasons they dip in and out of the market. Yeah. But the, the, the consistency of the service I deliver should be the same across the board. Mm, I agree. What are some of the key lessons you've learned in being an entrepreneur over the years? <sighs> There's so many, Adele. Um, <laughs> what are the hardest ones? <laughs> the ones that have hit you financially? That's a good place to start. 
Yeah, it's a very good place to start. Don't, I would say don't, I mean, th th there's two reasons. One, I've made the mistake of employing people. I've employed graphic designers sitting in my office on 15, 20 grand a year. But I look back at that and think, I could have got five times more graphic design for a third of the cost by outsourcing that. But the systems and the techniques weren't as available then. They were still available, but it wasn't as, as easily accessible. And things like accountants and personal assistants and telemarketers and offices to house people when they've got perfectly nice offices at home, all of that kind of stuff, you know, you know, paying for fixed overhead that's going to be with you next week and next month and this year is a big mistake for a lot of businesses. Far too many. They, loads of businesses will go under because of their mistakes in that particular area. So although I've made many mistakes and learned, I had a lot of hard knocks and a lot of very valuable experiences that will, you know, serve me well for the next 30 years in business um, and others. Um, I, I, I do strongly believe that's probably one of the, the key things that businesses think they need to do it themselves or employ someone to do it. They can't see by that and there are plenty of better solutions. Mm. I agree. So what have been um, your biggest or most pleasurable business experiences? Um, selling the business, I suppose, was good. That was probably was, a relief, wasn't it? <laughs> um, yes and no. I, I mean, it was good. It was 20 years. It was all I could see and it was great to kind of surface from that and think what do I do next, you know, to have that flexibility. I've created a job now, I've spent four or five months a year in Australia. Mm. I can work from anywhere. I was over in Ireland last week and I took my laptop and did four or five hours work on the Sunday. You know, I, I can keep my hand in from anywhere in the world. I wanted that built into the next job. So that's one of the best experiences that now I can go anywhere I want and still work. I, if I flick my laptop open, I'm in business. Mm. Mm. I never meet my clients, Adele. You and I have chatted, obviously, on the phone. We had a nice video mm. Skype meeting the other day. Um, that's as close as I get to people. Not that I'm, not that I'm antisocial these days, but a face-to-face -face meeting for me, driving in a car and spending an hour and a half and mm. all the pleasantries that go with it. Mm. It's very hard to price into jobs these days as well. So oh, I, 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 I like to set the set the rules of engagement, if you like, at the start. You know, I, I've got loads of clients who give me, have given me business for the past two, three years. I have never seen their face. They're just a voice at the end of the end of a Skype call. Mm. And they pass us business. They wake up in the morning and what they wanted's done. Mm. And if I had to meet them, I'd have to charge them more. Yeah. And it, so it doesn't affect. So I think, for me, that's been one of the most pleasant things. I don't need to do that. You know, I... You know, I don't need to get the, the suits all ready. At all times, suits all pressed and shiny shoes and shirts and ties and shaved and all that stuff. I don't need to do that anymore, um, do which you, is good. Yeah. Have you had any coaches or mentors support you in the development of your businesses? Not really. Um, if anything, I support a few business coaches and things like that where they give, they pass me their customers. Um which is quite good for them because I do a, th a lot of things that don't cross over into their territory. <coughs> and I always feel that that's a very good strategic fit for me with coaches and the like because they've got access to customers, but if the customers they have don't have proper sales and marketing strategies in place, then they won't make the money to pay that business coach. And, you know, that the... the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. If you take what a business coach does and you add what I can do, then the, the business owner is served better by the two services than either one on its own. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So no, I've, never, I've never used the services of business coaches, but I have met 
many clients because I get loads of um, referrals from business coaches and I see that the clients are doing very well as a result of it but I kind of consider myself to be a business coach of sorts so I'm kind of coaching myself as I go I suppose. Mm -hmm. So if you had three points or three key areas, ideas <coughs> that you wanted to give to a person, maybe a listener who is setting up a small business right now, Based on your experience, what would they be? Get a good business name. Mm -hmm. And a short one, so it, go, so it can be a Twitter handle. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, you don't want to go crazy, but <clears throat> there's still good names out there. Um, I've got a, I'm actually looking at two business names for, for companies I'm dealing with just now. And, you know, I've kind of developed a wee algorithm for it where I can find combinations of words and then pull them all together and then cross-check them against a database of domain registration to see if they're available. Mm. It's amazing what kind of names are out there, you know, Business Uplift, I own businessuplift.com, businessuplift.co.uk. It's an easy name. I, I, if I say to someone, if, you know, if someone asks me what my email address, I say steve at businessuplift.com, they never ask me to repeat it. Mm. It does what it says in the tin. Mm. So a, a business name that means something and you get a good domain name, I think will will stand the test of time, and they're still out there. If you if you've got the right tools, the business names are there. Mm -hmm. um, a good website is now key. It's got to be a responsive website where it looks as good on an iPad, a live stream, or a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. um, any business who doesn't build or have a website built for them that way is kind of kidding themselves on to a certain extent. Um, and websites are only as good as what's written on them. Um, I've spent a lot of money on websites before that didn't work. And I had to go to courses and go to New York and learn things to work out how to make websites work, how, you know, how to generate leads from websites. Um, and I've learned that. Mm. So probably the other piece of advice I would say is don't try and do it all yourself because you will make mistakes mm. and you're going to learn, you're going to burn your cash, cash and it might be the cash that keeps you in business that you're burning. Mm. Um, so look at the experts that you can afford to do things because they'll do it more cheaply than you think mm. and they'll help your business get up and running. And that this kind of applies to new or existing businesses. It's kind of the same thing. The, the, the mm. advice is much, much the same thing. There's a lot of new businesses considering rebranding, they're almost in the same boat as a new start. Yes. So what, um, are, oh, go on. what are your personal goals for the next three or five years? Well, I'm 48 just now. I'd like to, to be <coughs> absolutely semi-retired if that is uh, something to aim for. Semi-retired and that I'll maybe do a big Monday, Tuesday and I'm, I'm very late tapping around on the keyboard Wednesday, Thursday, and literally nothing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I could I could maintain that for a long, long time. So, making the business grow and having the personal flexibility to run my business from Australia and the UK, or be in Australia to visit my son and my friends over there, and be anywhere in Scotland that I want to, or the UK, or other places that I visit, still be able to do business, grow the business, make it more of a brand, perhaps franchise it off to other people who want to offer the kind of project management business development um, service that I'm offering to my clients. I'm pulling all the pieces together and working out what they need and then project managing the delivery of it. Mm. There's loads of guys out there who could do that. Mm. They'd probably be made redundant from jobs they didn't like anyway. <laughs> I could probably create a franchise around it and give them a better paying job, take all the skills that they've learned in all their previous jobs and help them deliver the range of packaged services that I've got to business owners who absolutely need it. So when you're 101, like I plan to be, sitting in your <laughs> rocking chair, what's going to give you the greatest reason to smile about the life that's gone before you? I would have to be my two sons mm -hmm. um, and been able to spend time with them. Um, 
I've got a friend who's got a daughter in Australia and he's in an unfortunate position that he's not been able to see much of her. You know, I'm there for all my son's birthdays, Christmases, all of that kind of stuff. So for, for me, being able to do that and, you know, watch them grow up and be there with them with quality time is absolutely key. And only business and working out how I want to structure my business to suit me in my life has allowed me to do that. So I think when I get to that stage, when I'm sitting on my rocking chair with my laptop tapping away, then I'm sure that will be the reason that I'll be smiling at that time. Yes, I'll be on my laptop sitting in my rocking chair as well. <laughs> we'll, prob similar. we'll probably be Skyping each other we'll talking Skyping. about it. Same <laughs> <and made it. laughs> Actually, or, or whatever the advanced technology of Skype is at that point. <laughs> That's right. I'll yes. be part of some kind of virtual Star Wars thing. Yes, yes. Steve, it's been lovely, lovely, lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm hoping my listeners has, have learned a lot from your your experiences and okay. you've had some real challenges and you've had some great successes. So thank you. It's, it's just been wonderful. Thank you, Dale. Nice to chat. See you. Bye-bye.